Hey, good evening to, to everybody. It's um, a little bit hard for me to, after this very fundamental talks, to to uh, come to my theme. It's really pretty much focused on on the German labor market, but German case is, in my view, quite interesting, and it has to do with the topics that were mentioned just before. So. As typically an American speaker starts with a joke, so I'm starting with an excuse. It's only on German labor market, and it's very a bit empirical, but I think that there are some more general points that we have to talk on. Um, no, this does not work. Okay, so let me start with the, with the sunny side of the, of the story. And then I'm coming afterwards to the, to the shady side of, of, the, of the German case. But the sunny side has to do with quantitative data. You see a lot of quite optimistic points. For example, if you look at unemployment, it peaked in 2005, and we, we reduced this to, to below 3 million. It was just mentioned, if you if you uh, f say the, the, that the concept is critical, you can calculate the underemployment concept, and you do include all the, all the people that are not counted as unemployed, then you get perhaps one million more, but it moves in parallel to the official employment figure. So what we see is really a progress with respect to the reduction of unemployment. The red curve is long-term unemployment. You see that you also have a, a decline in long-term unemployment. You can also see that the, the decrease was especially immediately after the labor market reforms from 2005 to 2008, and then it more or less moves in parallel. What I think is quite important, this is a very long perspective on uh, unemployment in Germany, and what you see after 1970 or so, this hysteresis effect, the stepwise increase in systemic unemployment. After every crisis, the, the, the minimum uh, unemployment in, in, a, in a boom period was higher than it was in the period before. After 2005, for the first time, the systemic unemployment decreased again. And this can be said to be a success. Negative hysteresis, so to speak. Hysteresis was we had in from the 1970s to the, to, to the roughly 2000. And it will continue. These are our prediction for the next year. The working population will start, uh, will, will keep increasing, and unemployment uh, at least slightly will go down. It was just mentioned before, the, the German response to the crisis. Uh, Germany was, uh, this is the, uh, the OECD countries and they have a real GDP growth uh, in, in, during the crisis um, on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis, the delta in the unemployment rate. And this is for the for typical, for the average OECD country. And the German case, is um, marked by the red arrows, and you see Germany had the lowest increase in unemployment, but it was affected more than the average OECD country by the crisis. That's clear, it's an exporting country, and this was, uh, and there was a breakdown in, in, in exports, and so this has been called by Paul Krugman the uh, Germany's job wonder. I think we coined this notion half a year before at our institute, and it was an extremely uh, interesting discussion on, on, on that because we, we saw this huge decrease in, in GDP, and we knew from the past that this should re be reflected in the unemployment rate, but it did not. And we dis had a lot of discussion in, in the institute, and then we, we, we came with a sort of solution, and we would call it a small job wonder. But Krugman, one half a year later, he, he, uh, of course, he, um, in he, his column in the New York Times, has, uh, coined internationally this uh, this uh, notion. Of course, I'm, I'm coming. You know, I'm coming from the seat of a bishop, 
but I don't believe in miracles. And so we have to, as scientists, we have to, to look behind it. And I, sorry, I have to correct you. It is not only a story of Kurzarbeit. Kurzarbeit is perhaps responsible for one third of, the, of cushioning the effect of, of the, the big crisis. There are other uh, instruments or institutions, one could say, that proved to be very helpful during the recession. One is working time accounts. Especially in the exporting industries, we have this sort of buffer stock for, for, um, for working time. And this means that, and I said it in, in the interview to a newspaper, we, we are something like world champions in within firm flexibility. And this institution helped us a lot to, 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 um, to get, or to, to, to cushion this, this really shock that hit the German economy. There are other t uh, sorts of working time flexibility. There are collective opening clauses also for, for wages to, 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 to respond to, to, the, to the crisis. And behind all that, I think it's a, a well-functioning social partnership that was really important for um, getting rid of the, the crisis. And I have to say that this institution proved to be very efficient, but the nature of the crisis was a demand-driven crisis. The things would be quite different in a structural crisis, like in Spain, where we had this um, uh, housing sector, housing market sector, so, so uh, uh, a big one, where the construction sector was, was too big uh, uh, relative to, to, to other countries. If you have a structural crisis, then, for example, Kurzarbeit perhaps is somewhat or much more critical. It might be seen as an automatic stabilizer, but the, the critical aspect is that it might um, f might give a, uh, or it might f conserve the, the structures that, that are perhaps uh, overcome. So the beverage curve was just mentioned. Here is an example of the German beverage curve, uh, the Germany, Germany's beverage curve. And you see the very long uh, time series behind that of the two uh, variables. And what you see in the, in the blue part of the curve is that it shifted outwards two times. And that's meant an increase in systemic or structural unemployment. And for the first time, as a green arrow, it um, started to move in the right direction, and it, it indicates reduction in structural employment. And a last thing I have should mention, which is sort of part of the German success story, uh, the very uh, nice or very low um, uh, unemployment rates for, for, for young people. Uh, you see that uh, Germany, together with Poland, is the only country where the youth unemployment declined um, from 2005 to 2012. Let me come to the shady side of the reforms. Segmentation, inequality, instability. I cannot go too much into detail on everything, but I will focus on inequality. But what could be said, and my, the, 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 uh, the answer, or the question I put in at, at the beginning is, um, what is the quantitative side and what's the qualitative side of the, the German case? And Quality of employment, I don't want to read all the, these points, but, but it has to do with stability of employment, sufficient earnings, social insurance, the care of sustainable employability, and in my view, it has also to do with sovereignty over working time from, from the part of the, <coughs> uh, of the employees. Um, all these aspects play a role if you talk about quality of a job. And what we see in the German case is that the so-called normal employment contract is declining over time. The atypical uh, contracts are not necessarily, or not necessarily mean precarious employment, but the probability that this is the case is much higher for, for an atypical uh, contract. And you see there is an 
aspect over age and uh, um, with respect to the, to the skill level. The uh, normal employment contracts increases with the skill level and increases with age. But especially the young people and the, the unskilled are typically in precarious or in atypical employment uh, forms, and this means higher uh, probability of precarious employment. Let me uh, talk about inequality. This gives you the, the relationship between the, the median D5 and the second D style, and uh, this is from 1984 uh, onwards, and perhaps you can, the three phases, slightly uh, increase in the, in the second half of the 80s, moved um, par in parallel to the, to the ex axis uh, in, the, in the first half of the 1990s. Then it started to increase quite, quite sharply. By the way, long ago before the labor market reforms, it started in the, in the second half of the 1990s. It's very interesting to to see what, what, are, what are the driving forces behind that. But uh, after the labor market reforms, it, it was accelerating. And today, we, we, we are in a situation, and this is one of our publications, the, the Institute's publication, it compares inequality or the, the share of the low pay sector over 17 European countries using microdata, and what you see here, Germany is um, at, the, at the second place after Litovia. If you take all the all forms of employment, also mini jobs and and, uh, and minor employment, then um, if you if you only consider full time employment, then the the picture is little. Uh, um, or it's it's more um, positive to, to Germany, but then you still have you're in the st still in the same league with Great Britain, and in former times it was completely different. Germany, the inequality of, of wages was in somewhere in between the the, the, the extremes, or it was somewhere in, in in the middle, and so it really has changed a lot. The, the level of inequality in, in Germany. This graph gives you an index of real gross earnings for three different skill groups. Mm. and starts from the 1984, goes to 2010. And what you see in the first period, until the, the mid of the 1990s, the three skill levels, or the, the wage increase of the three skill levels, more or less moved in parallel. And then, 1996 or so, something happens and the, the, the real wages of, of the high skilled still go up and uh, those for, for, the, for the low skilled really go down. And if you compare the, the, the level, the real level in 2010 to the level in 1984, you see a 5% 5%, uh, 5 uh, decrease in the real level. So what was a mantra, I would say, in the, in the after-war uh, German policy debate? Uh, Ludwig Erhard said there should be prosperity for everyone. It does not, it, it does not work anymore. So there, there we have quite large groups that do not profit from, say, technical progress or uh, globalization or whatsoever. They are losers. And you see it here quite clearly. These, these are full-time employed male persons in West Germany. So quite a homogeneous group. It has nothing to do with, with East or West uh, 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 differences. And we, we took um, men only because the, it's, uh, the, the, the figures are uh, more robust because we have the part-time problems for, for females. Uh, and so it's really here a uh, homogeneous group and you see what what is uh, you see this big increase in the wage dispersion for age 30 for, for young people it's even uh, even more um, the case but I don't want to go into detail there another point is that we have an increase in working poor I don't also don't want to go into details of this this figure but it simply shows that 
after the labor market reform, the, working, the share of working poor has increased markedly. And this figure shows you the higher job instability of certain group of people. If you, if you consider job st stability for, for the workforce, the complete workforce, for the entire workforce, then, then you won't find uh, a decrease in the, in the stability of job. Typically, tenure is quite long in, in, in Germany, and there is no trend over time for persons uh, above 30. But for the young people, as you see here, the average um, uh, and median job duration are declining from, say, 800 days for, for the um, uh, cohort born in 1963 to, say, 600 days something for, for the later cohorts born in the, in the late 70s. And from 800 to 600, this means a substantial change in job stability. So the young people have more unstable jobs. And among the young people, especially the low-skilled, uh, are affected. One could ask this question here. Did the Hartz reform destroy the German model? Um, I would say, if you, if you look at the elements that are crucial for the German system, I would say, mo in most cases, no. But there are some critical aspects. So the dual training system is important for a German case. They did not destroy it. Uh, relatively high job protection. OK, we have some more fixed term contracts, especially for young adults. But um, in general, I think the, 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 uh, the, the harsh reform, the, the, the main points were not on, on, on job protection. We have a high, we, in, in uh, a traditional German system, we have a high coverage of collective bargaining. Um, here we have really a declining trend, and this gives, uh, in my view, some, uh, some um, point to discuss, points to discuss. Strong will of social partnership, I would say it's still there. Generous social benefits, here we have a clearly an effect of the reforms, the, the, the social benefits or the in, in, in general are clearly not at that level they were before the, the reforms. I'll come to that in a, in a minute. And low wage dispersion was also part of the German model, as I showed you before. This is not uh, the case anymore. There were some reasons to, to for, uh, say, rational behind the reform, and here you see the, uh, was very often cited in, in uh, German newspaper, a sick men of the euro. It was not Greece, it was not Spain, it was Germany in 1999. Mm -hmm. um, one should keep that in mind, that the German economy was in quite um, precarious shape in, in that uh, time. And here as I listen to some parts, the, Systemic unemployment, as I showed you before. High financial burden through the German reunification. Low growth and low rates of job creation. Germany, a laggard in structural change with too high, as it sa as was said, too high a uh, share of manufacturing industry and too, um, too low share of, of services. Germany as a paradigm of sclerosis and segment of the Europe. And it was seen as an unsustainable development. Um, it was a social democratic uh, government at that time. Uh, and uh, this, I think this quotation of Schroeder, is, I, I like it quite, uh, quite a lot. It uh, reminds me, I don't want to, to read it, you can read it yourself, but it reminds some of the uh, Tomasi, uh, Di Lampedusa's Leopard, uh, everything must change if everything is to remain the, shame, uh, the same, meaning that if you want to conserve the, the uh, social system or the German model, in, uh, then you, you have to, to, to undergo some uh, changes. Basic elements of the reforms, I should make it um, short here. I think the, the main point was a merger of unemployment assistance and the welfare system. Meaning that the that after one year of unemployment insurance, 
a worker um, had a threat of, of a deep fall in social status uh, because the, the unemployment assistance is means tested. You have to, to open your books and to, 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 uh, um, to, to get further support. And this really made a lot of pressure on, on, on workers. And we see that, um, I skip this one here, uh, we, we see it in, in, in behavior. We have several services that document the change in behavior, that document this big pressure under which most workers became, uh, uh, this pressure that the workers um, had to face after, after the reforms. Here you see, for example, the will of, willingness of job seekers to accept lower skilled uh, tasks, lower wages, or special working conditions increased a lot in 2005 compared to the time before. And also in 2006, it was the case, but somewhat lower. And even for the employed people, the, and this is our survey, uh, this is an um, um, establishment survey that uh, documents that, and you see here also the, the, the change in the, in, the, in the behavioral components which, which are highly significant. So the problematic side of the labor market reforms, um, I would say we have the increasing segmentation of the labor market, decrease of normal employment, normal contracts, wage inequality, working poor, increasing job instability. And I would say the reforms, the, the, the motto of the reform was supporting and demanding, but the question is, the big question in my view is, was there a right balance between supporting and demanding? And one has to say, and this is uh, uh, to the address, perhaps to the, to the active labor market policy, in the, at least in the, in the period immediately after the reform, uh, there were um, problems in um, putting or, or fitting the, the, the instruments to, to the individual needs. I think there was some progress made, some sort of progress made in, in this respect, but uh, this was uh, a problem. Let me, I've come to the end now, but I would like to, to show you at least one thing. The rise in equality, because it, it's related to the current debate on minimum wages in, in Germany. We have this rise in inequality, and I would say there are two different positions with respect to, to this phenomenon. Position one is, means that, or says that the market increase in low paid sector was necessary to get less productive workers into job. This is the position typically held by the Employees Association or the more conservative uh, economist. The, of course, the consequence is egalitarianism would, would cost jobs. The second position is that the marked increase of the low-paid sector was not necessary for improving the labor market situation. Inequality could be seen as a collateral damage of the reforms, as an unintended collateral damage. And uh, th this would mean that you could uh, take measures to reduce inequality. How to decide between these two positions? And you hear it in, in the public debate every day. Um, just one idea. I've, I looked at the data, and I looked at persons who were continuously employed. So the argument that the inequality uh, should increase to, to pull these people into jobs is not valid in this case because these people are employed before and after. And if you, if you look at the, um, the, the data, this is what comes out. The inequality also increased for, for those groups of people that con were continuously employed. And so I think this is that the, the increase in inequality is, has gone at least too far because here you cannot argue that it, it was necessary to, to pull people into employment. Okay, my conclusion, is there a quantitative qualitative trade-off? I would say maybe in the short run, but not in the long run. Um, 
The increase in precarious employment is, in my view, not sustainable. There are costs of precarious unemployment, for example, um, uh, the, with respect to qualification of, of the workers. We have seen the, the figures on inequality. I would say it's much too much of a good thing, as a, to quote Ellen Krüger in this respect. Of course, some inequality is... Uh, is necessary for, for, for market economy, but uh, in the, the, what we saw in, in the past has gone too far, in, in my view. And within certain limits, and this is also, uh, I would um, um, if support the view of uh, uh, the speaker before, well, that within certain limits, we have sort of plateau of institution, and there's no conflict between efficiency and equality. And we can we have some some leeway to 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 um, to construct our institutions and to to um, to to form intelligent regulation. In my view, perhaps that could be a a buzzword for for the discussion. So I think I should stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.